Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christopher Lynn Logue. I'm a member of Thrive NYC, and I will be moderating this panel that we have today, When Harlem Saved the King, Mental Health in the Black Community Then and Now. We have a great set of panelists, and we're going to engage in a great dialogue about mental health. Before we begin, I just want to go over a couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, please mute yourself in the background. Uh, and if your video is on, please turn your video off so that we can avoid distractions and allow these great panelists the freedom to speak. Um, this panel, there will be opportunity for question and answer. So some of you submitted questions through registration. We appreciate that. But throughout the conversation, please drop your questions in the chat. And one of our one of my colleagues will be reviewing the chat and we'll bring those questions when that time comes. And then this, the closed captioning is available for this event. Um, I will post the link in the chat for those of you that would like to access closed captioning. All right. So I think we have a couple people still trying to get in. So I'm going to give it one, one more, one more second or a couple more seconds. All right. For those that want to access closed captioning, it should be in the chat. The all right. That's the link for those who want to access closed captioning. Please click the link. All right. So. Without further ado, we're gonna get started. Uh, first, I would like to introduce the panelists. Um, we have their information here on the screen. I apologize if you can't see the double Fs for some reason, but uh, we have Jeff, uh, Dr. Jeff Gradier, American psychologist. We have Eileen Spinner, who was Miss Azola Ware Curry's social worker. We have Sylvia White, who is the chief of staff for Harlem Hospital. Reverend Jacquez DeGraff, president of the Friends of Harlem Hospital. And we have Dana Bello, who is a librarian from County Cullen Branch, which is across the street from Harlem Hospital, as you all may know, all right? Um, so today's event is going to, as I mentioned, be a conversation about mental health in the black community. We're going to use When Harlem Save a King. We have several clips from the documentary that we want to share. That will be the springboard for various points of the conversation. All right, and so our goal today is that we can engage in this dialogue to help reduce some of the stigma around mental health care in the black community and also use that story to talk about why it's important for people that need care to get the care that they need, right? And we'll end the conversation with ways that people can access care, particularly in Harlem, in the Harlem community, all right? So um, we're looking for a great conversation. And uh, without further ado, we're gonna get started. I'm going to share my screen and play the first clip that we have for you all. We need to know these stories because it strengthens us for the things we got. To face. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. Dr. King coming to Harlem was not necessarily his terrain, you know, it's not where he operated. So here he comes into Harlem to promote his book, Stride Toward Freedom, at Bloomstein's store. While sitting there autographing books, the minute black woman came up. When she approaches him, she says that, are you Dr. King? And he says, yes, I am. And boom, she plunges the uh, letter over me into his chest. The next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. For I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. This is just a, a, a very intensely troubled woman. It's all kind of demons are possessing her, gathering a storm inside of her that she had to unleash. The attempt towards Martin Luther King was the schizophrenia because at the time of her arrest, she was hearing voices to kill Martin Luther King. He was against her. Miss Curry was mentally ill. Something set her off and something manipulated her. Well, we have a lot of Miss Currys in our community today. I heard a shout that from several women that uh, Dr. King was hurt. I grabbed her immediately by her arm. Three guys run out. Dr. King's been stabbed. We rushed into the place and Reverend King asked, don't move, don't even breathe. I see a woman, hysterical, wanted to pull the knife out. I grabbed her hand, twisted it, 
because he pulled the knife out. It was over the aorta. I never seen a person so calm in my life. He was like, he was almost like a saint. And I looked in his eyes. We, we will get through this, I guarantee you. So he looked at me and smiled. He said, we will. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. So we got in there and then the doctor, Niclerio, he wasn't a timid guy. And that's what you needed. You needed sort of a renegade. He went in there with Dr. Maynard and Dr. Cordyce, and my father quickly assessed the situation. The tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you're drowned in your own blood. That's the end of you. This wasn't like we have two minutes. Time was at the essence. Governor, the operation has been on for more than two hours. Have you heard any word? I saw him a while back, and we hope for it. But if not today, I can't stand except hope for the best. Blacks that had gone to school, studied medicine, even when they were discriminated against, saved the king, who helped to save a whole era. I'm passionate about the project because we have a generation of young people who are really out of touch with our leaders, civil rights leaders, those who have laid the foundation. If Dr. King had sneezed, so many of the things that Dr. King stood for and got moving would never have happened. They would have never seen the Voting Rights Act long before the Nobel Prize folk ever heard his name, long before he was brought into the White House. Harlem, New York saved his life and he went on from just a guy on his way up signing autographs to a guy that changed the world but it could have ended in Harlem but we wouldn't let it happen i want to say tonight that i too am happy that i didn't sneeze because if i had sneezed i wouldn't have had a chance to tell america about a dream that i had had if i had sneezed so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. All right. Um, very, very powerful, powerful documentary and powerful clip. First, I want to thank uh, Al Cohen, the director of the documentary, and his team for this idea to put this thing together. And uh, several of these panelists are involved in the documentary. So it's inc incredibly powerful and a, a privilege for us to, to have this in our, in our world. So very, very thankful for that. Um, hopefully everyone was able to see that clip clearly and hear the footage. Um, at this point in time, just wanna kind of start the conversation. And uh, first of all, thank Harlem Hospital for all the work that they did at that point in time. But what exactly happened? And so at this point, I'm going to ask Reverend DeGraff to come in and uh, follow by Sylvia White to talk about the incident itself, for those of us who may not be as familiar, and also Harlem Hospital's response at that point in time. So uh, uh, Reverend DeGraff, kick it off. Good afternoon. And today we celebrate Dr. King and his legacy uh, beyond the borders of the United States. But at that time, he was a center of controversy. Uh, he wasn't even welcome across Harlem. There were those who were saying, why Bloomsteins? Why not a black bookstore? Why not a black church? Uh, there was all kinds of controversy at that time. And, and just by way of introduction, uh, my mentor was his chief of staff, the Reverend Dr. Wyatt T. Walker. I'm the last person that Dr. Walker ordained his social justice legacy. But I met Dr. King as a teenager. And, and the aura that was described in the film uh, even as a 14-year-old in Atlanta at Morehouse, you could feel that aura. So, so Black folk knew that he was some kind of special, which is why the throng surrounded Bloomstein's when he was there. He, it was exciting that he had come to Harlem and that he was, he was uh, promoting his book, but he was really promoting his message. And, and Brother Lynn Lodge, his message was the original, yes, we can. We, we're not going to stay in this circumstance any longer. And it was a message of hope in a very, very dark time in America. And it was in that environment that the devil got busy. That's how we would have characterized it in the church. We didn't talk about mental health or mental wellness. We talked about someone who was demon possessed. 
and and and, and being demon possessed in that time meant being ostracized, laughed at, and humiliated because that's what mental illness represented at that time. Thank you for that. And so, um, so Mrs. Olaware Curry, she plunges that letter opener into his chest, and you know, Harlem Hospital was the place he was sent. So, Sylvia, can you speak about that, please? Certainly, I can. And uh, when Reverend King was stabbed, he was stabbed ten blocks away from Harlem Hospital. He was rushed to Harlem Hospital by ambulance where he was received into our emergency department. The emergency department at that time was located on the site of the existing Harlem Hospital at 135th Street and Lenox Avenue in the village of Harlem. He was received into the Department of Surgery where he was seen by two surgeons, Dr. John Cordyce was the lead surgeon in the surgery. And Dr. Emil Niclario was, Dr. Cordes was the leading thoracic, meaning uh, uh, issues of the heart surgeon. And Dr. Emil Niclario was also a, a leading surgeon in the community at that time. Additionally, they called in the chief of surgery who was Dr. Aubrey DeLambert Maynard. For this documentary, the Cohens did exhaustive research. They were also able to locate the nurses and the nurse practitioners who served Dr. King during his stay. There are a number of photographs of Dr. King here at Harlem Hospital, most notably a photograph of Dr. King, Mrs. Coretta Scott King and Dr. King's mother on the steps of Harlem Hospital when he was discharged. The surgeons did tell him that the, that the knife, the letter opener, it was a very sharp letter opener, was lodged in his chest in such a way that had he sneezed, he would surely have died. And so all of the accounts that you hear about the surgery as well as his recovery are true. Dr. King was very gracious to our doctors and remained in touch with Dr. Cordyce and Dr. Nuclario throughout his life. And so we have a number of letters and correspondences between Dr. King, Dr. Cordyce, and Dr. Nuclario. The, the actual surgery was very time consuming because they had to open his chest and remove his breast bones to be able to get at the wound. And so it was a very detailed uh, surgery. It's uh, very interesting now as we look back uh, in those days because we did it all without the modern technology that we have today. And so the fact that they were able to perform this heroic surgery to save Dr. King's life is all the more meaningful. And so this has been a, a wonderful journey for the hospital to be involved with Reverend Al Cohen and uh, Janet Cohen as they as they bring this important part of Harlem's history to the top of everyone's mind. And Harlem Hospital thanks you for this opportunity to be part of this journey. If I might just add one of the things that their heroic research was hampered by was racism, which existed then and exists to this day. And who tells the story and what? And so there was great footage that they have uh, rescued uh, but some of the pictures uh, that went out to the general public at that time minimized the role of Black health caregivers. Uh, black health caregivers, who were the heroes of Harlem Hospital, were excluded from, from some photos, were excluded from some quotes. And so this restoration of our history, particularly in Black History Month, is critical to the authenticity as we combat mental illness right now. Who is telling the story? Because our community, the people who worked in the hospital, that Ms. White just described, they knew the story. They told the story, but they had to tell it in the shadows and off of stage. And Harlem Hospital has continued to burnish that legacy and that story. And so this uh, documentary represents a coming together. And this panel today represents pivoting from history to the new history that we're making together today. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Uh, I always feel a very special connection to Dr. King. I went to Morehouse. 
And so there's a giant statue on campus that we walk by every day. And, you know, we spoke about him every day. And so I have great appreciation for him. And I have great appreciation for Harlem Hospital for all that work that they did to save his life so that he was able to go on and do what he was able to do. And thank you for bringing that point, Reverend DeGraff, about the who's telling the story, right? So we may be missing the importance of the black healthcare workers that were there and community members that were there. And so I'm very thankful for this documentary that brings forward that part of the story, which is very important. And so um, I'm going to jump to the next clip, um, which you know is another powerful clip from the documentary. So I'm gonna share my screen once again, and we'll take a look at that. Upon her arrest, she was interrogated by NYPD detectives. The transcript of the interrogation shed light on how confused and mentally disturbed she truly was. Miss Curry was mentally ill. Something set her off and something manipulated her to want to kill Dr. King. And we continue to have people who go without services in this neighborhood that in fact are in that same state. Well, we have a lot of Ms. Curry's in our community today. They have easy access to guns that are doing things. We should not be ashamed of our mentally ill. We should be ashamed if we don't move to heal them. We should be ashamed if we don't reach out and try to deal with them. Mental illness is not a new discovery. Uh, in, in our tradition, in our culture, we don't talk about that because we don't tell people our problems outside of our house or so-and-so is crazy. But now we have become educated so it appears that, that there is a, a prevalence in our community, but it has been hit with us historically. Our community knew back then that this woman was ill and needed help. And, and now it, it opens the door for us. It's a teaching moment as we celebrate the occasion of September 20th, 1958, to look at that occasion through new eyes and say that we need to look at the indicators and look at the indices of people in our community now who are struggling with emotional and mental illness. And we need to get them the help and re remove the stigma. Hiding problems don't solve them, exposing them solve them. And I think the story of Ms. Curry is to tell the story that this goes way back. We almost lost the king of our history. If the pre-hospitalization staff, meaning people that were in the ambulance, um, if they compressed too hard, if they removed the letter opener, he would have bled out. Um, he would have certainly died. And if the surgical techniques were not as precise as they were, and if they did not go in through the rib, if they went in through the normal channels, again, he would have died. Because we didn't deal with mental illness in 58, here we in the 21st century, we can't afford to keep ignoring the problem. So um, as it was mentioned, you know, this is a situation involving mental illness, right? As Olaware Curry was someone that was living with mental illness at that time. And this attack was a result of her mental illness. And so um, Reverend DeGraff, you mentioned this in, the, in that clip, you know, the stigma around mental illness in our community historically. Uh, so can you go into that a little more and, and speak about that and why that has hindered us? in the past and, and still current to this day. And, and I'm gonna top, I'm gonna tap in Dr. Jeff to also go into this topic and uh, we'll transition into that. So um, Reverend DeGraff. Well, well our, part of our culture because of our history in America is that we don't tell things outside of our home. We, we don't take our problems to others. And so it, it was don't tell that, even though that is widely known. And, and the reason it's particularly significant right now because our community is hurting in a way that we haven't been hurting in a mighty long time. COVID has changed the whole game, if you will, the whole paradigm. And so young people are, are committing suicide. Violence, uh, gun violence is up. Uh, domestic violence is up. Alcoholism is up. Uh, and, 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 and isolation and loneliness and depression are up. How do you measure that? Uh, by various things that I know uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Jeff Gadier will talk about. But, but it's pervasive in the community. And the difference then is the church is closed. The, the, the theater is closed. Even the nightclubs are closed. And so we can't get together. 
And so in my view, the mental wellness campaign is at an acute point. If you look at the picture of Azola Curry at that point, she looks right into the camera and she's not ashamed. She's not, she's, she's in some other place. Today, every, every other day, it seems, we see someone who pushed someone off a subway platform, threw an Asian American into a mailbox, uh, stabbed their neighbor's child, uh, killed a gang, uh, killed, shot at a gang member, but ki killed the toddler. We we're beset by harrowing incidents and episodes. And yet we know somebody on our floor in our building, around the corner, down the block. We know someone, but now we at least have the dialogue that says so-and-so needs to go get help. And, and for, particularly for those who are not violent, uh, when we discover them, we need to, to say to them, you, you, we can go with you to get help. Harlem Hospital has been a beacon of that, but the church is playing a role even live stream online by saying part of it is that we need to stay connected to one another. Someone is isolated, we need to call them. Not send a text, not send an email, we need to call them. Uh, uh, we need to knock on the door. How are you doing? And so uh, I'm going to pause here because I'm anxious as anyone to hear what the good doctor is going to say. But to say that we are being plagued right now with great consequences. When the church opens again, when the school opens again, it's going to be a completely different place. Um, Jacques, uh, everything that you've said uh, has absolutely been right on. Uh, the only thing that I might add on to that was uh, during the time that uh, Isola Ware Curry um, had uh, attempted uh, this murder on uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, um, we certainly not only in the black and brown community uh, did not uh, appreciate uh, what uh, mental health, um, the importance of it, and how mental illness just impacts in such a negative way when untreated, um, the quality of life uh, and certainly how we live. Uh, I think we've learned much more, uh, even though uh, we know that again, in the black and brown community, there's still a stigma uh, around talking around mental illness. Uh, it is folks like Chris and many of the younger uh, people in our generations who are actually leading the charge towards the importance of mental wellness. Uh, and it is our hope that this film, uh, what uh, Reverend Cohen uh, and Janet Cohen and many of you who are part of the film have put together to show what can happen when a person has untreated mental illness, uh, how it is not only a disaster for themselves, but for their family, for their community, uh, and therefore the importance of making sure that it does take a village to work with an individual with mental illness, to help them with compliance, to make sure that we have uh, models like Harlem Hospital that is uh, reaching out to people in the community to make sure that we are addressing uh, mental health challenges. It's not always about illness. Uh, it is about the challenges that we all face, but that people with mental illness can lead normal lives if we are able to get them to treatment. And that is the biggest thing. And, and, and Reverend DeGraff really, you know, highlighted uh, what happens when it is untreated, the pushings of people in the subway, in front of subway cars, um, the hate crimes uh, that we see against various parts of our community, especially now with COVID-19, where we see that racism in itself has become a delusional, uh, a mental illness in its own way, where they're acting out against Asians and Asian Americans and other groups. So it is important that with this film, we understand the importance of treating mental illness so that people can have productive lives. And we can do that, but we all have to do it together. Thank you both for that. I, I want to um, I want to interject something. Oh, I should note that I am a social worker, so I do have some mental health background as part of this conversation. So I appreciate that highlight that I'm part of the younger generation bringing to the forefront, um, really what our office is trying to do. I want to make a note that mental health is, is operates on a spectrum. And you got at this, Dr. Jeff, when you said it's not 
always mental illness is the day to day mental health challenges that all of us face. Right. And so, you know, this example is one of the more extreme examples of someone not receiving treatment and something very tragic and deadly happening. And some of the things that you mentioned also, uh, Reverend DeGraff, but it, in, in terms of mental health challenges and just the day-to-day -day struggles or some of the current struggles with COVID, right? Isolation and, you know, separation anxieties or what have you, grief. Um, these are day-to-day -day mental health challenges that we could all be facing and people face. Can either of you speak about, you know, not necessarily the most extreme cases, but just the importance of seeking help for all of the mental health challenges that we, ex that we experience? Well, let's see. Well, let, let me speak about myself because I think it's important that we serve as role models, right? If you talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. Uh, I've been very clear in the press that I've dealt with- uh, Thank I, you. I, you too. Um, am I hearing things? <laughs> so um, I've made it very clear that I've had some mental health challenges not necessarily mental illness, but mental health challenges, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety, uh, persistent illness uh, disorder, which uh, we used to call uh, hypochondriasis, the, the fear of uh, unusual fear of illness. And, you know, Chris, you, you teach that and you talk about that too in your work. Um, and I've been able to manage it. I don't let it manage me. How do we do it? We do it through therapy. We do it through connecting with other people. We do it through reading. We do it through informal support groups. So certainly it something does not have to rise to the level of a schizophrenia as we saw with Isola, uh, 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 as, as, as we saw with Isola. Um, but the important thing is, I'm sorry, we have some noise in the background here. Uh, but the important thing is even with the day-to-day -day, um, issues that we deal with, it's important that we address them and we don't have to get to the point of an Isola Ware Curry where it just becomes completely unmanageable. Chris, one of the other dimensions of this, and, and uh, Jeff has described his particular situation, but let's pull the lens back because I wanna highlight uh, the, the, the necessity for people from our community to be part of mental wellness, mental health. And that is, Jeff has just shared with us something very personal, uh, but that is his nature. But he can tell you that there were people who were in his medical class who didn't make it. He can tell you about people and the circumstances where he wasn't allowed to move forward or obstacles were placed because he was black. And so, and so the authenticity of the people who are delivering the care the connectedness to our communities and our culture are, are essential to having effective programs. You know, Jeff is not talking about some, some things that he heard about where he studied in a book. He's talking about real life experiences and people from communities that he knows. Sylvia White has been the chief of staff at Harlem Hospital for over 25 years. She can't possibly do that just for the paycheck. She does it because she's in the community and she delivers in the community, and she is one of our heroes. So the combination of these two heroes on this panel bring a level of authenticity. And Chris, as you know, when people are telling you their problems, they gotta have the confidence that you can hear them, that, that you know what my story is. You don't have to be, you don't have to be afflicted with whatever my attention or anxiety is, but I need to know that you at least get it, that you get me. And, and in, in, in offering people assistance, sometimes it's just, through a period of time, I'm going through anxiety because my mother died. I'm going through an anxiety because I lost my job or I can't pay my rent. I need to know that the people that I'm talking to get me and, 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 and have help. All help is not medication. Uh, uh, help can be uh, ongoing therapy, so, so, but, but it has to be something that is accessible. It has to be something that is real. And that's why it's important to have these two pillars on this panel to talk to us about mental health, which is really important. Thank you. And, you know, I just have to say, I love the, I love the appreciation and love for everyone, for each other on the panel, right? Uh, we always got to big each other up as black people. Um, but you both mentioned something very important is that, you know, the support that we need, it's, it's available. 
but it has to be authentic, right? Um, and we have to provide it. We have to be open and communicate and say, hey, I'm struggling with these situations at this point in time. Can you help me or can you help me get help, right? And uh, we'll, we'll get to resources in, in a moment or towards the end of the conversation. But um, yeah, it's true. You know, all the help doesn't necessarily mean medication. It doesn't mean long-term therapy. It could be the focus group, like Jeff talked about, or the support groups. It could just be, you know, finding a, a way to decompress successfully and positively, right? So there are various ways to get support to maintain your mental health, right? And so um, we'll get into that. But that is a good segue for our third clip. So I'm going to play it real quickly. Um, it is a bit of a lengthier clip, so I want to make sure we get it started so that we can engage in the conversation. But really, we're going to focus on why it's important for people to receive treatment so that they can become those sexual, successful people in society, right? And so um, we'll get into this right now. Let's see. Let me share my screen again. Isn't it wonderful that, you know, Zoom allows us to, to have these types of functions virtually? After the interrogation, Isola was transferred to Bellevue Hospital for psychological evaluation. Isola Curry was a victim of, of mental imbalance and he believed in nonviolence so strongly he didn't want to prosecute it. And he said so to the press. She was still there a week later when Martin Luther King gave his first press conference since the stabbing. No, I think I can truly say that I have no bitterness in my heart for Mrs. Kerr, and I don't think there was a moment during the whole experience that I felt any bitterness or any ill will toward her. How would you describe your feelings toward Mrs. Curry? Well, I, I feel that uh, she definitely, uh, definitely needs help. And uh, it is my hope that all people of goodwill will seek to aid her in getting the help that she apparently needs in order to become a free and uh, constructive member of society. Do you feel that what she did was a product of what you called uh, recently the climate of violence in this country, or do you feel that it's the work of a deranged woman? Well, it could well be a combination of both. When asked further if he believed Isola to be a part of a larger conspiracy to kill him, King said, it is possible. Even if she is unbalanced, an unbalanced person can be used by balanced people. About two months after the stabbing, after King had been released from the hospital, reunited with his family and honored by Governor Harriman, Isola Ware Curry was convicted of attempted murder in the first degree and admitted to Matawan State Hospital for the criminally insane. She would end up staying at Matawan for 14 years until 1972, when she was transferred to Manhattan State Hospital and put under the supervision of a young social worker named Eileen Spinner. In 1972, I was the social worker on the Harlem unit at Manhattan State Hospital when Isola Curry came to be a client on that ward. Isola Curry came to the unit because Dana Mora and Matawan State Hospital were emptying. My job was to do discharge planning. So I was assessing Isola for the purpose of discharge. Was she able to live outside of the hospital? Now, because of her particular status as a criminally insane patient, she could never be discharged officially, but she could live outside of the hospital. So I found her a home in Queens, in Laurelton, Queens. It would later be known that the family she stayed with after being released would be the Walden family. Well, the first day that I accepted Isola, I didn't accept her as that person that had caused this attempted assassination. I had no knowledge of that. This, I accepted Isola as a refined little old lady. I felt like whatever her problem was, she does not exhibit any of that behavior now. So let that skeleton stay dead. You know, she didn't, um, she didn't pose this big threat and whatever happened, it was a mistake. And telling anybody about it would just make them 
not like her. My friends knew of Isola. My friends, um, when they came to the house, they would see Isola, they would speak to Isola, but they did not know who she was or what, she, what happened with her. And it was just not necessary for them to know. And she was just Isola. I would like to wear a to uh, look on Isola and think on Isola and remember Isola as a person who deserves to be happy, to be comfortable, to be cared about. I would like the world to realize that it could have been them in her place. That skeleton that she has in her closet could have been any one of us, Isola had an illness, and apparently, from where I sit and living with Isola, that illness she overcame. And that's why, at this point, I feel that anyone who reads of Isola should realize that this is a person who at that time was out of control and from that time deserves all the help, all the love, all the attention, and all the happiness, all the happiness that could be put on her. She deserves it. This was a good woman to us, all of us. And I would like for people to understand that once you had an illness, it does not have to be a lasting illness. And I feel that people should not be stigmatized and treated uh, with a long handled spoon just because they had an illness. I would like for anyone to think when they think of Isola or when they think of our family is that we weren't harboring uh, the assassinator or the attempted assassinator of Martin Luther King, we were helping someone to be a part of society without that stigma of what happened during a period of time when her mind wasn't right. She was a regular, everyday person. That's it. Ooh, um, that is a incredibly, incredibly powerful, powerful clip. And, you know, I'm very thankful that we were able to show that. I appreciate the When Harlem Save the King team for allowing us to show that. Um, a couple of things that stand out to me in that clip is, you know, she had a mental illness. You know, she was living with a mental illness. It's, it's a lifelong illness potentially, but it doesn't mean that you can't be successful and a productive member of society. And, you know, thanks to the work of, Eileen identifying a place for her and a treatment plan that they worked on, she was able to integrate back into society, right? And, you know, deserve that second chance that she received, right? And so, um, Eileen, if you can, just for a moment, talk about your work with Isola and, and how you came to the determination that she could be returned back into society. Well, that was my job to uh, discharge people when I was at Manhattan State in 1972. You know, that's a long time ago. And since she was on her medicine and not showing any symptoms, I found the Walden family and they agreed to take her. Now, as I said, I think in the clip, you can't discharge a criminally insane person. So she was still a ward of the state, but she could live in the Walden's home. And she did live in the Walden's home, I believe, until she was put in a nursing home later in her life. And she was fine with the Waldens. They liked her very much. And I visited their once a month until I left the state in 78. And then the people from Creedmoor would visit her and make sure that she was taking the medicine. And that's what happened. She never got discharged uh, officially, even when she was in the nursing home in Queens, she uh, still was a ward of the state, but she was fine. In a, and that was the thing at the time, it was a foster care for adults, they called it. So she was in a foster care home but she was not a, a child, she was an adult. And they had that for people who couldn't leave the hospital, but at least could 
have some kind of a private life. And Isola thought she was going to be their maid, but she was a, a domestic previously. And uh, I don't think they treated her as a maid, but they, you know, she took care of the kids and she was part of the family. And that's what happened. And uh, her mental illness was under control the whole time she was there. I don't know what else you want to know, but that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Could you speak about why it's important for those living with mental illness to be in a situation like that so they can receive support? Well, they need to be on medicine and some people are hospitalized. I understand the mental hospitals today are much more empty than they used to be when I was there. And they're, uh, they're done more on outpatient basis. If they're not taking their medicine and they're ending up uh, psychotic, they're gonna end up in the hospital. But if they're taking the antipsychotic meds, then they could live on the outside. And if, unless they're criminally insane, then they have to be supervised. But other than that, they could live on their own. And there's plenty of schizophrenic people who are uh, living on their own with medicine. You know, they're, they're an outpatient, they're under psychiatry care, and they're fine. If they don't take their medicine, they're in trouble. <laughs> so hopefully they take their medicine and they could live a normal life. Does Thank that be your question, Chris? I hope. Yes, yes. And uh, I'm going to tag in Dr. Jeff in a moment, but basically, uh, too, yeah. uh, so treatment is important, right? And whatever the treatment plan calls for is important. Mm -hmm. A part of that treatment for her was medicine, but it also was being an integrated uh, society, integrated back into society. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeff, can you talk about treatment as it relates to mental illness, why it's important, how it's effective, um, you know, different types of treatment that are available, anything really? Sure. Uh, I, I want to make a, a, a quick point, though, um, if I may, Chris, uh, before we talk about the different forms of uh, treatment. And Aileen, thank you for all of your service throughout the years to all of our communities. And you're a very special friend to the black and brown community. People don't know that and they should know that you always have been and always will be. So thank you. Thank um, you. We need we need allies like just like you. Um, Chris, I wanted to point out something, and Jacques, I don't know whether you checked this out, I think you did, when uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about Isola Ware Curry, when the person asked him, uh, is this a uh, product of a person who was deranged? Remember when they used to use words like that, deranged, uh, mm -hmm. unhinged, uh, or whether it was, and talk about uh, that causing a stigma, right, Chris? Uh, when we use terms like that, um, but ask that question, or was it, and then went on to ask, or was it having to do with violence in that particular community, right? And the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. responded, it could have been a combination of both. And Think about what is going on in our society right now. Think about what happened with that capital insurrection. That yes, we know that white supremacy was at play. We understand that there were uh, players uh, who were embedded perhaps in different parts of our government. That's what we're starting to hear, right? Allegedly, that I'm trying to be careful legally here. But one of the things that I know that all of the mental health experts on this panel and the people who are joining us in this audience is that whomever those individuals were part of that insurrection, some of them were of sound mind, obviously. Some of them were somewhat delusional with regard to being possessed by racism, but there are others who were clearly mentally unbalanced and how the rhetoric, the hate talk, the steal the vote, all of that manipulation got people from the margins and brought them into this violent insurrection. And so when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said that perhaps Isola Ware, he didn't use these words, could have been manipulated because of her mental illness, we have to pay attention to that because this is what 
has been happening politically. This is what's going on in our country right now, but this is also what happens when people are not getting care that they can be easily manipulated. They become victims many times over. So what's out there as far as mental health care? We know there are many things out there. We know there's psychotherapy. We know there's the psychiatric medications and Aileen talked about that. The, the, the challenge with the medications, as we all know, uh, not so much what it is that they're doing with regard to uh, helping, but also what the side effects of the medications are and then why that leads to so many people not being compliant on the medications because the side effects are sometimes worse than the symptoms themselves. And I know our psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, pharmacists certainly are working to try to improve that. Um, there is the psychotherapy, there is the art therapy, uh, there are uh, all sorts of rehabilitation therapy, speech therapies, and so on that help someone improve their lives, not just about mental illness, but all of these different therapies help us to be able to step up and conquer some of the things that are holding us back. There's, of course, we know telemedicine, telepsychology, telesocial worker, um, uh, processes that are out there. So it's all out there for us. There are clinics at Harlem Hospital. There are services everywhere, but we do know that there are some barriers, whether it's not having enough broadband or even having a computer to be able to go online, whether it's a situation of not having the right insurance and therefore getting inferior services. But if we continue to fight, if we continue to look at the health disparities and try to get those services out there to everyone, they will be there. But you know, this is something, Chris, that you talked about, and then I'm just gonna keep quiet. The most important thing is we have one another, informal support groups. So even if we can't get to our therapists, it's important that as families and that as a community that we support one another and be able to help with life reinforcers, making sure that people have housing, making sure that they have education, making sure that they have a uh, job training, because you can give them all the therapy in the world, give them all the medication in the world, but if they don't have a place to live, guess what? We see the downward spiral again. So it's all out there. And many of us who are part of this call, not just the panelists, but the people who are part of this, all bring in their own particular contributions. Jeff, Jeff mentioned something that is critical uh, when he talked about his own situation uh, and then pivoted to, to walking the walk. If Martin Luther King in his response to Gabe Pressman had said, this woman is troubled, she needs to be executed. If he had said, uh, I'm mad as hell and I'd rather not comment at this time. If he had said one of a dozen other things that you or I might have said in a similar circumstance, but he modeled his faith. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and a critical element of our entire conversation is forgiveness and faith. Uh, faith doesn't have a color. Aileen saw past the circumstance and saw her soul and that this woman needs help. Those two people who in some parts of town said they harbored a criminal who tried to kill our hopes. Th that's what someone would characterize that family. But there was nothing in their conversation that reflected that. Faith and, and, and forgiveness have to, be, have to be lived. And that's part of the authenticity and why an Aileen could impact on a community where she didn't look like the people from the community, but they didn't look at the exterior, they felt her interior. The, the, the success of Chris and your social work uh, and, and Project Thrive is dependent upon connectivity. Uh, all this, all the, everything else that we've said is that the people who are the recipients don't feel connected, none of the other parts matter. And the other thing that Jeff said that I want to pivot to is the environment that we all must talk about. Uh, when, when something that I call an insurrection happened on January 6th is made to appear legitimate, then those who have legitimate mental health issues feel that their issues may not be that bad at all if Senator so-and-so is saying it's all right, if Congressman so-and-so is saying it's all right, if law enforcement is saying it's all right. 
So, so part of the role of, of social justice movement is that we have to call out these things and put it in an entire paradigm because permeating the system is racism. Uh, we can't get around it. We can't uh, ignore it. We have to confront it head on. And if Black Lives Matter, then we've got to put that at the center of this conversation. So I, I want to uh, thank you all for your contributions in that section. Um, you know, speaking immediately to what Reverend DeGraff mentioned, you know, how Dr. King responded, you know, there is a great deal of grace and understanding that he carried that all of us should strive to, you know, I'll just put that out there. But in terms of this conversation about mental illness in our community, there has to be some level of grace, right? We don't always wanna talk about it. We don't wanna acknowledge it. We just wanna label people, but there has to be some grace. If someone comes forward and says, hey, I'm struggling, I need some support. Let's show some grace to that individual and work with them to identify all those great things that Dr. Jeff mentioned. There are definitely many modalities of treatment. It's not just relying on medicine. Right. Um, they are all different types of therapy. They're all different types of support, social connection, whatever it might be. But it sometimes starts with that grace that Dr. King showed that day. He, he, you know, Reverend DeGraff is correct. Had he responded in a different way, it, she may not receive the help that she needed. Right. She may have been treated very differently. Right. And so I know in the comments, there's some commentary about how she was treated. Yeah, she could have been treated better. Certainly. We're talking about 60 years ago. Now we know better so we can do better these days. Right. Um, but in the key of that section and just in general is that treatment does help, right? And so we want to identify how we can get treated if we do need support. And so I'm going to jump back to Sylvia White who will speak about the type of mental health resources that are available at Harlem Hospital. Uh, we have a colleague from, first I'll let uh, Ms. White speak about that. Thank you. Thank you. Harlem Hospital Center, along with the health and 17 facilities in the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, have a broad array of mental health services. We serve everyone from children who have mental health issues through adults. And so there are programs for children, there are programs for adolescents, there are programs for teenagers, young adults, middle-aged adults, straight up through geriatric adults, because at every stage of our lives, we all face different issues. Geriatric psychiatry is an issue that has come very much to the forefront in light of COVID. Because of social distancing and social isolation, we find that many, the, the numbers of geriatric patients who present for inpatient and outpatient services is significantly increased. So all of our services are available for, to, to everyone, but with specific emphasis on those kinds of issues that can be treated today through telemedicine and through outpatient services. We don't hospitalize at the same level that we used to hospitalize for certain issues. Many issues don't require the level of medication that they used to require. Many behavioral health and psychiatric issues are treatable through a variety of modalities. And so Harlem Hospital continues today, as we did then, to treat behavioral health and mental health issues. It is important to note that our patient was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., not Miss Isola Curry. She was not brought to the same facility. In fact, she was incarcerated. Her mental health services did not begin until after her assessment through uh, criminal justice uh, uh, protocols. And so she was not rushed to Harlem Hospital for mental health services. In fact, she was never our patient. Our patient was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And thank you for talking about the, the tons of services. Yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our services because uh, some of our services are, are provided through psychiatrists. Some are provided through psychotherapists. Some are provided through psychologists. Many of our services are provided through social workers. Many of our services are provided through emergency uh, psychiatric services. So it really depends on the nature and acuity of the person's distress that the level of services is assessed 
to determine the level of services needed and then a treatment protocol is uh, delivered. So Chris, Chris it's important to, to note one thing and why Thrive is so important. Uh, Aileen mentioned that at one point, uh, Isola was sent to Creedmoor. Mm -hmm. uh, history reflects and why it's important to know is Creedmoor was not always a, a healthcare palace uh, mm -hmm. and it had its own issues. And, yeah. and, and while she might have received great care, I'm just saying we have grown in our understanding of how we treat mental illness, number one. And number two, I just want to salute uh, the caregivers because it's, it's so critical to understand that caregivers don't stand and just issue medication, they give of themselves. And, 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 and over time, there's a cumulative impact of giving of yourself. And so this COVID crisis has, has emphasized for us the care for the caregivers. Uh, the Friends of Harlem Hospital uh, primarily before I arrived, get, raised money to get equipment to supplement the public uh, 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 appropriation. But we recognize that the most important asset of Harlem Hospital are the people. Mm -hmm. And so we've created support systems and affirmations for the people of Harlem Hospital because they are the essential ingredient in mental wellness in our community. So, so I just want to salute, again, not only Jeff, Aileen, and Sylvia, but all the caregivers on this call and to encourage them uh, to make sure that their self-care is, is, is intentional. Uh, we need you, we appreciate you, uh, and we know that you are uh, not at risk, but you have given sacrificially, and we want to support and affirm you. Can I just say one thing? Uh, Isola never went to Creedmoor. She was Manhattan State's person, but because she lived in Queens, Creedmoor visited the Waldens. But okay. she never was hospitalized at Creedmoor. Okay. Just thank you for that clarification. And, you know, thank you, Sylvia, for introducing all those services at Harlem Hospital. You know, uh, it sounds like there's something there for anyone, right? And we'll find the right modality for you, right? <laughs> and um, Reverend DeGraff is correct. You know, for all of the caregivers, whether that be mental health clinicians or whoever, um, make sure that you take care of yourself. Right. The one thing that I remember very vividly from social work school, we cannot uh, put our mask. We can't put someone else's mask on on the airplane until we put ours on. Right. So I can't give my cup if my cup is empty. So I need to take care of myself. So all the healthcare professionals, all the essential workers, everyone, make sure that you are taking care of yourself as much as you try to take care of others. Um, I want to introduce our colleague from uh, County Cullen Library. So we spoke previously about some of the therapeutic and medical or, you know, psychological approaches that Harlem Hospital offers. I want to talk, I want Dana to jump in from uh, County Cullen and talk about some of the resources that they have made available through their library and some of the activities that they're trying to do to improve mental wellness within the community. Dana, are you around? Yes, I'm here. Um, County Cullen and the New York Public Library have teamed up with Thrive NYC and we do offer um, mental health talks through, um, through Thrive. Um, before the pandemic, they were on site. After the pandemic, they have all gone virtual. Um, we also work with Local Voices Network and we do community conversations that surround topics about the community. And one of those topics is mental health. And these conversations are recorded um, and made available to the press and other members of the community to basically get um, the community to have a say and what goes on in their community. Um, we also offer book discussions that thrive on being and including a community. Um, our book discussions usually are on our Black Experience Collection as well as Black cookbooks. And we also have job support, which is a one-on-one -on -one job support. Um, we do work with people who have gaps in their job history. So formerly incarcerated, homeless, mental health, and they're specifically online one-on-one -on -one programs that get you in a community with someone else to help you with your resume if you're trying to switch careers and things like that. Thank you, Dana. And so I think, it's important to note, as we've kind of mentioned through various points of the conversation, they're very different. There are a lot of things that intersect with someone's mental health, and thus there are very different things that we can do to support mental health and well-being, right? And so some of those programs are not clinician-led, 
right? Helping people get their job situation together is a way to assist someone's mental health. Because as we mentioned earlier, you can have some anxiety about your job status, right? And so uh, creating community and providing social support and identifying other areas that intersect with mental health and finding ways to support our ways to treat our mental health as well. And so thank you for NYPL for the work that they're doing with Spaces to Thrive. Thank you, County Cullen, for the things that you all are doing. Thank you, Dana, for the things that you all are doing, right? Um, I wanna jump, I wanna ask uh, our colleague from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Eunice, to uh, speak about some of the resources that they were able to identify, some of them DOH specific and just neighborhood specific in Harlem. So Eunice, if you're around, go ahead and jump on. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so my name is Eunice and I do these uh, mental health trainings every day. So if anyone's ever interested, you can always go on the Thrive website, Department of Health website to find these mental health COVID trainings uh, to understand what we're doing for the community. But otherwise resources that we do like to pass on. Uh, I do have a PDF list that'll go out to everyone. Uh, so I have a uni union settlement mental health services, uh, which I've looked into and I've actually done a mental health first aid training there to their staff. So uh, I put their number, their website, but they provide a variety of services, including mental health services for adults, children, uh, seniors. And uh, what they try to do best is they try to do strength-based perspective for people in the community and resilience building tools to help enable uh, children, adolescents, adults, and seniors to heal and go on to lead these fulfilling lives because it's so important for us to empower individuals. And I've actually left the intake coordinator's uh, number and email if anyone is interested. And then other services that we do have in the community are, you know, mental health, uh, MNTL health, psychotherapy group practice. They do take a variety of insurance, insur insurances and Medicaid uh, for anyone that is interested. They also provide different, they have a, a, an array of different mental health related uh, topics and they try to destigmatize mental health in Harlem. So they're, they are their own group and you can always contact them. They are, uh, they are separate from the city, but I do really appreciate the work they do in the community. And once again, in my, me and my colleagues have done, a, I've trained 150,000 New Yorkers in mental health first aid, walking around into different communities just to talk to them about these mental health issues. Uh, but we also have in Harlem, East Harlem Action Center, which is a Department of Health building. Uh, it's at 158 East 115th Street, if, no one, if people don't know. Uh, but what they do basically is they provide different programs and services in the community. I know it might be limited during this pandemic because they are a, a pod site for uh, vaccines, but I would recommend calling the number that I left uh, there for them. You can go on their website to find what programs they have. And it's not just mental health related, but it's a lot of health service as well. Uh, and last but not least, I just I, I put a, a series of websites that we have in the city, whether it's NYC Well phone number and website that actually has all these free mental health apps for you to download on your phone if you just want to be more aware of yourself. Uh, what's it called? We also have uh, our own Department of Health COVID resource website because of uh, what the Reverend was talking about when we talk about mental health and COVID and how this has changed during this pandemic. Uh, we have just, you can put in any zip code that you're in and it'll give you a list of resources for that area uh, and not just mental health based, but food services, community organizations. And last website I bring up is uh, this, my colleague showed me yesterday, amazing, Aunt Bertha website. Uh, you can put in any zip code in the five boroughs uh, and it will give you a list of resources in each borough. Uh, and for, East, for Harlem alone, came up to over like 2,000 resources. Uh, resources that maybe walking through Harlem you never knew were there. So definitely just looking into these websites that I put in into this document. Uh, and just all these resources. NYCUL is the highly recommended resource because doing all these mental health trainings, what I've learned with stigma is people are more likely to make a phone call before they go in to see someone because of all the stigma that they've heard and dealt with in their life uh, around mental illnesses. But I do really encourage you all to take our one hour or three hour training that's coming out very soon around mental health. Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Eunice. Um, he and his team did some great work uh, creating a PDF. And so we are going to make sure to share that out with all the registrants, all the participants that attended today um, so that you'll have it. You can readily you know, use it or pass it on to other people that need it. We're gonna compile some of the resources from Harlem Hospital and some of the things that Dana mentioned as well. Um, he did mention NYC Well, which is the city's hotline as it, re as it relates to mental health, right? And so um, you can, 
dial in on that hotline is operated 24 hours a day. You can speak to someone in the interim, in the short term, and then they can also work with you on identifying long-term care as well. And it is completely free. It is completely confidential. Again, operates 24 hours a day. You can call in, you can text in, you can even chat online. And so we'll make sure to include that information in the follow-up as well. Um, so, you know, mental health first aid, a, a excellent way to learn to have an overview of mental health and figure out how to engage in conversations in your community. Um, there is one more question that I want to ask, and then we're going to go to question and answer. I know that there have been tons of of uh, questions that have come through the chat, so we'll, I know Sophie is monitoring that, and so we'll get into that. But real quickly, um, Dr. Jeff, Eileen, Sylvia, Dana, Reverend uh, DeGraff, what are some ways, in addition to conversations like this, what are some concrete strategies that we can do amongst each other, with our family, with our community, to just talk about mental health in a destigmatizing way, to encourage people to seek support? And we've talked about a lot of things, but if there's anything that we've missed that, that has come up to you, what is a, a concrete way, something that we can do real quickly today with our family members? I believe we can watch this film together as a family and use that as a conversation piece as to what can happen with mental illness when someone is um, uh, manipulated, perhaps shunned, um, not given the treatment that they needed. Uh, and uh, someone made a, um, you know, a comment about how Isola Ware Curry was treated. Uh, I talked about how she was, um, how they use the terms deranged or unhinged. Um, so all of those things I believe are um, Obama teachable moments as to how we need to respect and love and appreciate uh, people who have mental health challenges because they're our brother, our sister, our mother, our father, our friends, uh, and how we need to be there for them so that they can be there for us. They are no less than us in many ways because of the way they suffer. There's much that we can learn from them. Anybody else with any other particular ideas or things that we can do? Yeah, I, I think one of the one of the key elements in talking about mental wellness is to identify and connect and be aware of the pain of the families. Uh, uh, it's not personality. It's not a character failing to be afflicted. And and uh, in the language that we we've, we've heard here this afternoon and. Uh, and in our compassion, we have to reach out to the families and be sensitive to them and give them the support that they need. Families are suffering. Families get divided. Families get stigmatized. And, and so in that suffering, people looking for a lifeline and the, the lifeline are the people in programs and also the attitudes that are reflected on this call this afternoon. So we do have to have some positive, uh, positive attitudes and, and be supportive as possible. Um, I have a couple questions, some of them in the chat, some hands raised, we have some claps, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to ask that the questions be put in the chat. So Pamela, I know that you have a question. If possible, would you put it in the chat or would you prefer to speak it out? She prefers would pre to speak it I would, out. I would prefer to speak it out. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm so glad that I joined this session. I have a, a, a problem within my family. My nephew, he resides in Beaufort, South Carolina though. He's had a mental health problem that his mother, uh, you know, uh, she act like she didn't see it. Everyone could see it but her. You know how you're in denial. So now he's been diagnosed as schizophrenic and now he has even entered the forensic psych because he's gotten arrested. So now it's gonna be a spiral of mental health and the, you know, correctional mental health cycle. Um, I don't know if anyone on the line would be aware of any programs they may have in South Carolina or could guide me in what we could do because right now he's in a hospital as to the next step to take. I'm sure that um, perhaps someone uh, from um, this particular organization might be able to help you with that research uh, but I would tell you one of the things that needs to happen uh, is that there has to be a family member at the hospital every single day involved uh, in the particular care 
uh, that it's your nephew you're talking about? It's my nephew. Yep, that your nephew is getting and making sure that he gets absolutely um, and complete quality uh, health care. Uh, what we tend to find is when someone uh, does, uh, especially if they go in against their will, uh, are in a hospital and family uh, are not involved, that sometimes, you know, they get very, very poor health care and then they're discharged to the streets with no follow-up, mm -hmm. with no follow-up plan. And then it becomes that, that revolving door that you're concerned about and that I definitely would be concerned about. Um, I think um, certainly the folks at Harlem Hospital might be able to tell you or give you some techniques, uh, some empowerment strategies uh, on how to deal with an institution uh, with regard uh, to the care and, and what uh, social work, what other services that are, uh, are, that are out there. We talked about life reinforcers, uh, job training, uh, medication compliance, um, having a roof over his head, uh, getting into a group home if he needs that, you know, what the, the, you know, how to bring all of these services uh, in at the same time. But whatever you do with that particular hospital, that institution, just don't let them kick him out prematurely unless you are afraid that um, they're not caring for him in a proper way. In that case, you need for him to be transferred to another facility too, too often, too quickly, sometimes because of lack of insurance, sometimes because a person is black or brown, they're just not getting the good and consistent follow-up care. They're just, it just become, they're just pushing them out to bring in more people which is something that I'm sure that Harlem Hospital does not do and mm -hmm. therefore can help you with that. Um, and then I, I myself retired from Bellevue Hospital. I was an officer for 27 years. So I know the forensic psych part mm -hmm. and what they're doing to my nephew now, he's just being medicated, he's not responding. So every day, I guess he's just being medicated. And then, you know, sometimes they overly medicate and it's just gonna be a spiral, but, uh, yeah, I would like to see if I could get some kind of, at least some information to my sister, because, you know, I'm in New York. Yeah. But um, maybe some information. Real quick, Eunice, before you jump in on that, I want to say, Pamela, we um, we are part of a coalition with various cities across the nation, so we can work with you to potentially identify some services that are available in South Carolina. So we yes. can reach out to our partners in South Carolina to identify specific services I there. I appreciate that. So if you, if, if you can, uh, email me offline and we can try to make some connections for you or at least provide you some information in that regard thank Eunice I know you want to jump in thank yeah. you so much uh, Pamela while you were speaking I, I just went to Aunt Bertha's website and I put in a random zip code in uh, South Carolina and it came up with a list of 18 outpatient clinics in South in that zip code alone so uh, you could always use the Aunt Bertha website as well just to look up different areas and you know vet those resources and finding the right one for your family member so that might be a helpful resource, the On Bertha website. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so I just want to say that our time is till 1.30. We do have questions. We're going to try to answer some questions. If the panelists are amenable, we may stay over a little longer to answer some. If you all have time, you're welcome to stay. The Zoom goes on as long as we want it to go on, all right? <laughs> um, so uh, we have some questions. Sophie, uh, are you going to say them? Do you want me to read them? If you send them to me, how do we want to sure, do this? I can, um, I can speak them. Thank you, everybody, for the discussion today. Um, we collected some questions via the registration that I wanted to pop up here to make sure those get addressed. So, um, Reverend DeGraff, I think this is a great question for you, um, based on something you just said, actually. So, how does this seminar, or how do workshops like this one, um, help uh, the community? Um, and and why, why do you think there's such a disparity right now in, in um, access to services and, and the prevalence of stigma? Well, I'll, I'll start with the, the, the easier part is uh, the stigma is, is historic. And uh, th this panel uh, sheds light in dark places. The more conversations we can have with some specificity, not bromides and cliches, but uh, some specific resources, ask for this at Harlem Hospital, go to this website on Barthas, or listen to what Jeff Gardier is talking about in terms of modality, recognize that in some shape, form or fashion, we are all in this together. 
maybe you don't want to talk about that cousin who doesn't come to family gatherings. Uh, maybe uh, the neighbor across the hall, but we're all affected by this. And to take the stigma off is, is vitally important. And the, the health disparities, the health disparities, uh, I've been saying this every platform I get. When people talk about COVID and they talk about the science, uh, we believe the science, it's the scientists we have had a problem with. We've been mistreated by a system that has failed us, not because of the Tuskegee Airmen or Henrietta Lack, but because of what happened to somebody's sister or mother or grandmother or daughter when they went to get uh, help and they were treated and they weren't given pain medication. Or when they were told that you may have the symptoms, but go home and come back later and then they died at home. Uh, so, so the system has failed us and we are confronting the system through raising intelligence and awareness in fora like this and by also raising the compassion quotient. You know, it's easy when you're so close to the problem. Pamela just talked about, my sister doesn't want to deal with it. Why? It's, it's too painful by herself. It's too painful when I'm unequipped. And so when you know that there are others who are dealing with it, when you know that there are specific things that can be done, then I think we can move forward together. Thank you so much for that. Real quick, um, can I uh, shout? Oh yeah, please. Can I shout the Reverend out? Uh, receiving his uh, COVID nineteen vaccination yesterday, I did see that on on New York One. I wanted to shout that out. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, one question that came from uh, Karen in the chat is about uh, programs um, to become a mental health counselor. And I think this is an important one um, because we've talked um, you know, about the importance of accessible mental health support. And a lot of that uh, is about having a workforce, a mental health workforce um, that reflects the diverse demographics of this country, right? And we know that we have shortages of mental health uh, uh, counselors in general, and particularly, we don't have enough providers of color. Um, and so Chris, actually, as a social worker, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the different pathways um, available for people who are interested in uh, joining the mental health workforce. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm, I'm on the spot. Okay. So yeah. Well, anybody can chime in. But perhaps <laughs> you can get us started. Dr. Gardier, this might be a nice one for you as well. I will, uh, I'll definitely get us started. And so I, I went to social work school. So that is definitely one avenue to get involved in, in mental health practice and to receive training and credentials and understanding. Um, but obviously there's psychiatry, there's psychology. Um, so there's definitely a mental health counseling. You know, there are definitely different types of counseling that you can go to school for. Um, but definitely, you know, getting, getting training from academic institutions or through certification processes is definitely a way to get involved in, in, in upping your knowledge and being able to be a provider in the community. Um, in terms of clinicians of color, you know, this is a, a tricky one. And it's something that I, I'm always constantly thinking about. There are various, and we can provide this in our follow-up as well. There are various initiatives and websites and ways that people are trying to identify clinicians of color, right? So you have therapy for black girls, inclusive therapists, and various sites like that that can help identify clinicians of color in your area, right? And so um, I know there's a lot of work within our community to identify each other and get us on these different platforms so that people can find us readily. Um, but there are definitely mechanisms for identifying clinicians of color. You know, I wanna get into a situation where we can create a pipeline and just start recruiting more younger people and get them trained from an early age or get them in the process of becoming clinicians, right? So that's a, a project that I want to work on. Maybe Dr. Jeff can help me with that. But there are various ways to get involved. Um, these are just some of the things that I know. We'll make sure to include resources for identifying clinicians of color, right? We'll make sure to include that in our follow-up. Dr. Jeff or Eileen, any other ideas or strategies around getting involved in mental health as a professional? Well, I know that uh, there's also another great organization called cliniciansofcolor.org uh, that you all should check out. Um, they can provide you uh, all sorts of resources. Um, and why do we talk about the importance of clinicians of color? Uh, simply because we know for the most part that they have the cultural sensitivity and the cultural competence they can identify. Uh, but one of the things that we're doing with clinicians of color 
um, is also uh, building a, a, a training uh, for uh, therapists who are not clinicians of color, uh, but then who through the training can be certified with regard to uh, cultural sensitivity and cultural competence, because the fact is there's just not enough of us. I think 7% of social workers are black in this country. 5% of psychologists are black. Three to 5% of psychiatrists are black. Uh, so they're, you know, so you can't just rely on us to provide the care but whomever you go to must have that cultural sensitivity and cultural competence. Uh, there are a lot of programs that are out there that uh, get it, they get it, Black Lives Matter. Uh, they're doing many, many things as far as having a DEAI task force, uh, diversity, uh, equity, inclusion. Um, they are looking for minority students. Do your work, go on to the websites. Uh, some of them are giving scholarships. My uh, children were fortunate enough to get into some of these programs uh, where they really wanted to diversify and therefore uh, gave them very good financial aid packages. So you have to do the work, you do have to do the research um, and th it's out there, it's out there but you know, you have to be able to just be diligent. It's like chasing down that vaccine, isn't it uh, Jacques, right? Uh, it certainly is. Vaccine hunters. You know, I had to put my name on, I don't, I don't know, 30, 40 websites before I was finally able to get um, uh, the vaccine myself. So um, just be diligent. Uh, but it is important. I know a lot of people are asking, well, why should I get a college education or, or master's uh, in psychology or social work or whatever the case may be? There, there aren't jobs out there. Trust me, there are a lot of jobs out there. As a matter of fact, I think Harlem Hospital is hiring right now, aren't they? Chris, Chris before she answers, I, there was, uh, while paying attention to the, our discussion, I thought I saw in the chat that there are some one hour, three hour, some workshops that can equip folk to have some things to deal with. Uh, everybody is not going to go become a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a social worker. But if we could have some of the rudimentary tools uh, to be to make a difference in our communities, that would be a great advance. Could you could you talk about that or whoever put it in the chat? Eunice, can you speak about those trainings that are offered through DOH? Yes. Uh, so what we have in DOH, uh, one of the trainings I do is the one hour 3C mental health equity and resilience training. Uh, and another one that we're coming out with uh, next month, I just conducted the pilot training is the three hour expanded 3C training that grows into details around mental health uh, in, in different communities. And of course, how this pandemic debilitated different communities. And uh, especially if we're yes, talking- Excuse about me, who, who are these workshops for? anyone uh, in the public can join. So what we'll do is like a church will say, we want this training for our, uh, you know, for our population and they can all log into our training and it's all free. And uh, we do them for hospitals, we do them for community organizations. And uh, also I did add in uh, blackmentalhealth.com, which is for the Black Mental Health Alliance that does train uh, black clinicians uh, and uh, helps people in the black community uh, by having black clinicians help them as well. All right. Thank you, Eunice, for that. So um, I understand that Sylvia may have to go. So if she wants to say anything, she can say something right now or she just wants to wave goodbye to everyone. That's fine. Sylvia? Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you all for having me, particularly Reverend and Mrs. Cohen. Thank you so much, Chris, for the leadership and, and Dr. Jeff and Reverend DeGraff, my fellow panelists, Dana Bello and Aline Spinner. This has been a wonderful forum and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about when Harlem saved a king. Thank you and good afternoon to you all. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Chris, uh, my apologies. I also have to um, uh, leave this call with these incredible people. Uh, thank you so much to our fellow panelists. Uh, thank you, Reverend Cohen and Janet Cohen for including me. Jacques, always a pleasure. Aileen, everyone, uh, great to speak with you. Um, I actually have to give testimony to um, uh, Connecticut le uh, legislatures on medical aid in dying, something that I'll be talking to Reverend Cohen about uh, with regard to uh, perhaps putting uh, some sort of a documentary, something that we have to look at end of life 
uh, mm -hmm. disparities that we often don't talk about. We don't have advanced directives. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's that, that I think is the next great, great project. But let's keep our eyes on the prize. It's this project today. It's about um, the importance of addressing mental illness and also the importance of keeping up our mental health spiritually, physically, psychologically. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Chris, Chris, last Friday, the CDC released uh, a report that indicated that the first time since World War II, the life expectancy of Americans had declined. Mm -hmm. And while the average decline was one year, the decline for Blacks, well, for women was 2.78 years, and for Black men, it was three years. Uh, death and pain are pervasive now in our community. They take many different forms. And so uh, mental health and mental wellness are acutely needed by our community in, in, in ever increasing numbers. If we ever needed this call, we sure do need it now. Thank you to the Cohens. Uh, thank you to Thrive. Thank you through, uh, to my fellow panelists. And uh, thank you uh, to, um, to New York for, having the, for putting the resources together to address this issue. And, uh, and I just want to close, Chris, with the notion that whatever you or the Cohens are doing, I'm on a phone call away. Keep up the good work and Godspeed. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, um, I'm going to use this time to just close us out. I want to respect everybody's time. We are past time. Um, Eileen, did you want to say anything? No, I have to go. I'm glad you are okay. closing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I want to thank everyone for their participation. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Definitely thanks to the panelists for their contributions. Thank you to the Cohen family for that beautiful documentary and for allowing us to see pieces of it. We will share all of these resources that were mentioned. We took diligent notes. We have notes from the conversation. People put together PDFs. So we're going to make sure to get all of this information out to you all. Um, you know, we just hope that everyone found this as helpful as possible. I am going to pop up a poll. If you have time, please fill it out. It just speaks about the effectiveness of this program and that re that uh, evaluation helps us determine how we can continue this in the future all right so um thank you all for participating you should see the poll is launched if you're around and available please answer thank you again thank you again thank you again and please please everyone please find a way to take care of yourself find a way to assist those that are important to you as well